June FMG exam 2021. These are few recall based questions which I, I will be discussing one by one. The first question was 25 year old maid returning from China and was found to have fever. The investigation was done and what was the screening test which must have been uh, done on this patient? The answer is going to be RT-PCR as all of you are aware. The COVID-19 pandemic is going on and this is a RNA virus. <coughs> so to amplify the genomics uh, genome of the RNA virus, what we do is the reverse transcriptase PCR, which is abbreviated as RT-PCR. In this technique, what is being done, the mRNA of the virus or any infectious agent is first converted to complementary DNA which is then sent for PCR. So we have a machine called RT-PCR machine that's called thermocycler and in that the PCR is being done. So this is the answer will be RT-PCR. The second question was on neutral lipid which is stored in liver. We know when liver stores lipid it's called fatty liver and fatty liver, the kind of lipid which is stored is the triacylglycerol. The fatty acid is actually stored in the form of triacylglycerol. So the answer is going to be triacylglycerol in this. The fatty acid as such is not getting stored. It's converted to triacylglycerol and that's getting stored. So that's called fatty liver. If you can see this, these are the pictures of uh, fatty liver where you can uh, see the deposition of uh, lipids, triacylglycerol in the hepatocytes. And you can see the nodular appearance of the liver, which is destroyed because of these lipid depositions and that we call it as advanced stage of uh, cirrhosis. Now, you must know that the reasons for fatty liver, why we have deposition of triacylglycerol in the liver. So there are certain factors which are responsible for deposition of triacylglycerol and all those factors are going to interrupt either with the VLDL formation or the secretion of VLDL from the liver, that presents an enhanced deposition of triacylglycerol in the liver. Because VLDL is a vehicle which is actually transporting the triacylglycerol from the liver outside the liver. Right. So those factors which are interrupting the either the formation of VLDL or its secretion from the liver are resulting in deposition of triacylglycerol in the liver and please understand these are the factors which are responsible for fatty liver puromycin, ethionine, carbon tetrachloride, chloroform, phosphorus, lead, arsenic or rotic acid, protein deficiency which interrupts with the formation of apoprotein of VLDL, essential fatty acid deficiency which again interrupts with the phospholipid formation, vitamin deficiency which results in increased oxidative stress and disruption of the VLDL whatever it is formed, excessive alcohol intake which results in more of the fatty acid accumulation which in turn is actually getting accumulated in the form of triacylglycerol. On the other hand we have certain factors for lipotropic factors which are mobilizing the lipid out of the liver lipotropic lipo means lipid tropic means mobilization so lipotropic factors are going to enhance the formation of VLDL and its secretion from the liver so most of the liver tonic they have uh, one or more of these lipotropic factors in it if you have a bottle of uh, liver tonic in your home you could just go and see you must be finding as a constituent uh, of uh, that liver tonic the methionine the lecithin the choline so these are lipotropic factors which are helping the lipid mobilization out of the liver. In other words, they help in secretion of the VLDL and avoid the formation of fatty liver. So they are choline, lecithin, inositol, methionine and betaine. You can remember a mnemonic line for this. Then vitamin E, selenium and omega-3 fatty acid. Now coming to the next question which is asking about the cofactor of glutathione peroxidase enzyme. See, glutathione peroxidase enzyme is a very important enzyme which contains selenocysteine. Selenocysteine is said to be 21st amino acid and for the making of selenocysteine you need to have selenium which is required you know to replace the oxygen of the serine. So serine is modified to selenocysteine and this selenocysteine containing amino uh, selenocysteine amino acid containing proteins are few in number in our system. The glutathione peroxidase is the most important one. So let's uh, enumerate 
uh, you write down the names of those proteins, important proteins which are having selenocysteine in them for which the selenium is required. So one is as we have discussed is the glutathione peroxidase. Another thing you write selenoprotein P. Then you write thioredoxin reductase. Then you write DIRDNase enzyme. So these are the enzymes which are uh, you know um, having the selenocysteine in it. They say there are almost two dozen of proteins, human proteins, which are having selenocysteine. The specific proteins uh, where the, a lot of research has been done and they have enumerated the number of selenocysteine and their position are these uh, uh, enzymes where the selenocysteine is found. So, frankly speaking, the selenium is not acting as a cofactor, you know, for glutathione peroxidase. Rather, it is going to make your selenocysteine, which is going to be part and parcel of the polypeptide of glutathione peroxidase. So, this is a very often repeated question in this fashion. So, technically, this question is not very correct because selenium is not acting as a cofactor. Rather, it is uh, required for making of selenocysteine, which then becomes part of glutathione peroxidase. Coming to the next question which was recalled, 25 year old male is presenting with hypercholesterolemia. Elder brother is uh, died few days, few years back due to some heart disease. LDL receptor defect was found in this patient and what may be the probable diagnosis. This is again a very often repeated question and uh, uh, this is a case of familial hypercholesterolemia. And according to Fredrickson's classification, this is type 2A hyperlipidemia. In this, what happens? The LDL receptor is mutated. LDL receptor when mutated, you know, the LDL receptor is there at the liver. This is liver and this we find it it as LDL receptor. We have the specific characteristic of LDL receptor that it's not only found on liver, it is also found on extra hepatic tissue. It's an altogether different thing. But what one thing you must know, this LDL receptor is responsible for clearance of LDL particle from the plasma. This is LDL and this is plasma. The LDL is distributing the cholesterol to the tissues, but if the tissues are not accepting the LDL, the liver has got the duty of clearing this LDL particle from the circulation. Now, the domain which is identified by this LDL receptor on the LDL particle is ApoB100. So LDL particle, we have only one apoprotein that is B100 and that is recognized by LDL receptor. In other words, LDL receptor is the only receptor which can recognize ApoB100. So that is how the LDL is getting cleared from the liver by LDL receptor. In addition to identifying B100, the LDL receptor also is having capacity to identify ApoE. That's a different thing. But please understand, LDL is having only B100. And the only receptor which identify B100 is the LDL receptor. So you understand that LDL will be cleared only by the LDL receptor. No other receptor can clear it because no other receptor are having the capacity to identify B100. So now we have got these two things uh, which are very conceptual. The LDL particle is having B100 and LDL receptor is uh, though identifying B100 and E both. And uh, But for the recognition of LDL, the recognition of B100 is required and that capacity only LDL receptor is having. So that clears the LDL particle. Now, defect of any, either the mutation of LDL receptor or the mutation of B100 will not allow this kind of association of LDL with the corresponding LDL receptor and LDL will tend to increase in the plasma. Hope you understand. The first problem when the LDL receptor is mutated is called type 2A hyperlipidemia. And the second problem where the LDL receptor is normal but B100 is mutated is called type 2B problem. So majority of the patients of familial hypercholesterolemia are suffering with type 2A where the mutation is at the level of LDL receptor, B100 is normal. But there are certain, uh, you know, section of the patient suffering with familial hypercholesterolemia where the LDL receptor is probably normal, it's not mutated. The mutation is there at the level of B100. So you should do both these two. Though this question is simple, there are, they have clearly given you in the question that there is a defect in LDL receptor. So LDL receptor mutation is there. It's a clear-cut case of 2A. That is familial hypercholesterolemia type 2A. And let's see what is the answer in this. Familial hypercholesterolemia. This one. 
is the answer in this. Right. Now coming to the next question. The fifth question is talking to you about 26 year old lady who is presenting with acute abdominal pain and associated neuropsychiatric feature. Laparotomy was planned. The baby patient was having the acute abdominal pain. So laparotomy was planned to see what is actually there inside. But uh, suddenly what happens, a lab investigation result came and urine was turning back on, black on exposure to sunlight. It was reported by the lab personnel that urine is turning black on exposure to sunlight. So what may be this case? And if you see the options, they are asking you, uh, these are porphyria and which porphyria it may be. The answer in this question is acute intermittent porphyria. This is a porphyria which is having pure neuropsychiatric manifestation. Pure neuropsychiatric manifestation. Porphyria cutinata tetata, you have cutaneous manifestation. Congenital erythropoietic porphyria, again, you have cutaneous manifestation. Variegated porphyria, you have cutaneous as well as neurovisceral manifestations. The acute abdominal pain in this lady is because of involvement of peripheral neurons, and uh, that's a very common presentation of acute intermittent porphyria. This is the slide which is talking to you about all the porphyrias which are related with heme biosynthesis. If you see none of the enzyme is spared of the heme biosynthesis, whether you talk about allosynthase 2 or you talk about allodehydratase or the next enzyme that's called HMB synthase also known as PBGD aminase or UPG1 synthase or UPG3 synthase or UPG3 decarboxylase, coproporphyrinogen oxidase, protoporphyrinogen oxidase, ferrochelatase, all are in all are involved in diseases. Their deficiency is associated with one or other problem. If you see, we have X-linked protoporphyria. We have uh, allodehydratase deficiency porphyria. We have acute intermittent porphyria because of deficiency of this enzyme, congenital erythropoietic porphyria, porphyria cutanea tarda, hereditary coproporphyria, variegated and erythropoietic protoporphyria. I have written the inheritance. If you see, most are autosomal dominant, except three which are autosomal recessive. The ferrochelatase deficiency, the UPG3 de deficiency, allodehydratase deficiency or autosomal recessive. And as the name implies, X-linked to the porphyria is X-linked. This erythropoietic and hepatic classification is based on predominant organs where enzyme deficiency is found. So we see majority are hepatic, but the first and last one is erythropoietic and somewhere in the middle congenital erythropoietic porphyria is erythropoietic, where bone marrow cells are involved. Now most important column is the manifestation, how they manifest. If you see both manifestation, cutaneous and neurovisceral manifestation is seen in hereditary coproporphyria and variegated porphyria and pure cutaneous manifestation is seen in majority of porphyrias and the neurovisceral manifestation is seen in uh, allodehydratase deficiency porphyria which is very rare and acute intermittent porphyria. So now if you see the question once again the answer is in this will be acute intermittent porphyria because clinical history is not at all talking about any cutaneous manifestation. So this is a very important question and very much repeated question and I expect that you uh, are familiar with this table because this table is very very important. Now the urine is turning black. That urine turning black is, uh, don't get confused with l urea where classically we say the urine is turning black. That's certainly there. But even in porphyria, we have urine which is turning dark, not exactly black, but dark brown, which if a lot of porphyrins are uh, excreted in the urine may give you kind of blackish discoloration. So just don't get misguided by the fact the black discoloration of the urine is only for alkaptan urea. Yes, it is there, but even in porphyria, where porphyrinogens are excreted and getting oxidized, they are turning the urine black. Right. And uh, when you examine that urine for wavelength absorption, you will find the maximum absorption of wavelength at 405 nanometer, which is called SORID band. You can see this kind of peak absorption of wavelength at 405 nanometer, which is called SORID band. You can see the cutaneous manifestation in cutaneous type of porphyrias. Now the next question was, zero derma pigmentosa, what is the defective DNA repair? 
Xeroderma pigmentosa, it's a pre-malignant skin disorder where on exposure to ultraviolet light, the child gets uh, blistering and, uh, uh, you know, the uh, photosensitivity, blistering and the scarring of the skin. It's a pre-malignant condition which increases the risk of uh, uh, skin malignancy as well as internal malignancy and this is due to problem in the nucleotide excision repair nucleotide excision repair this is because of accumulation of thymine dimers which are not rectified due to deficiency of one or other enzyme of nucleotide excision repair now this table again is talking about the various repair mechanism and their defect uh, resulting in certain diseases like mismatch repair system is resulting in hereditary non polyposis colon cancer, nucleotide excision repair resulting in zero derma pigmentosa, cocaine syndrome, then trico or triodystrophy, base excision repair resulting in mute YH associated polyposis, helicase problem results in Bloom syndrome, this is double stranded break repair, non homologous and joining repair associated with skit, and homologous and joining repair associated with so many disorders. So you must be familiar with this table for understanding that type of question. And this in uh, yeah, this is talking about the repair mechanism where you can see that uh, how the thymine dimer portion of the DNA is getting excised and then synthesis takes place. Not this question. Marasmus is commonly seen in Indian children. This is due to now, let me tell you one thing. The protein energy malnutrition are classified into two categories. One is Quasherkar and uh, another is Marasmus. Quasherkar is because of adequate carbohydrate intake but less of protein intake. Because of that, there is a lot of edematous presentation in Quasherkar. But in Marasmus, less of carbohydrate as well as less of protein consumption. It's a severe starvation where no carbohydrate, no protein intake. So there is emaciation. You can see the bony, um, grow, bony you know, visibility of rib cages in marasmus. So that's there the absolute deficiency of carbohydrate and protein intake is there. Now in this, they're asking you marasmus. And as I've told you, both carbohydrate and protein intake is affected. Now, which one is the predominant? In this, if you see the option, they have not given any such option where they talk about just the, uh, you know, uh, they talk about the carbon protein deficiency both. So now you have to select between these two. Which one will be the better answer? In my opinion, the lower intake of carbohydrate will be the better option because in Quasherkar, it's a predominant protein deficiency. In Marasmus, there, is, there are both deficiency but predominantly carbohydrate intake deficiency. Coming to the next question, 73 year old male lady coming to the OPD with diffuse weakness and tingling sensation over her arms and legs. Neurological examination is revealing extensive and flexor muscles of lower extremities. Mm, weakness is there. Now vibration position sense is also affected. Which vitamin deficiency is associated with this? Most likely to have B12 deficiency because uh, that is having the severe combined immuno, uh, sorry, subacute, not severe combined, it's a subacute combined degeneration where the myelination is affected in B12 deficiency and that results in such kind of neurological presentation. Now, 40-year-old male is presenting with complaint of shortness of breath, that is dyspnea, and while walking or climbing the stairs. Now, what is high in the blood? Homocysteine. Methyl melanyl coe was found to be normal. It's a very important catch point in this question. Methyl melanyl coe coming out in the urine, we suspect B12 deficiency, but this may not be the condition because methyl melanyl coe is normal in the urine. Now, homocysteine is high. Which of the following vitamin deficiencies is most likely to be associated with this finding? With these findings. So the uh, male is having the shortness of breath while walking, climbing stairs, maybe because of anemia. So some sort of anemia is there and uh, homocysteine is high. Now when we say homocysteine is high, please understand for homocysteine further metabolism, we need to have certain vitamins like vitamin B6, we need vitamin B12, we need vitamin oh, 9 that is folic acid. So B12 deficiency is ruled out because of normal methyl melanyl CoE because methyl melanyl CoE mutase enzyme which further acts on methyl melanyl CoE is 
requiring B12. So if methylmalonyl-CoA is not high in the urine, it suggests your normal B12 intake. And as I told you, they are hinting you towards the anemia where shortness of breath is noticed. So B6 deficiency and folic acid deficiency both are associated with anemia. If you see precisely, even B6 deficiency is associated with microcytic hypochromic anemia because this is needed, needed for ALA synthase enzyme which is needed in heme synthesis. So B6 deficiency also results in anemia and of course the folic acid deficiency also results in megaloblastic anemia. Because folic acid deficiency absolutely results in, ultimately results in uh, trapping of, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know the B12 deficiency. It will ultimately both are interlinked. B12 deficiency is linked with B9 deficiency. B9 deficiency is linked with B12 deficiency. So now, what may be the answer in this question? We understand that it may not be a case of B12 deficiency. So we strike off this. Niacin has got no role here. Now the confusion is between pyridoxine and folic acid. Both looks right in this case. We have to select one. In my opinion, it's better to go for pyridoxin because it's directly linked with the homocysteine conversion to, uh, you know, cysteine in its further metabolism. Cystathione beta synthase, cystathionase enzyme, you know, they require B6. So B6 is directly related. So in my opinion, the B6 will be the answer in this question, though technically the framing of this question is not absolutely right. Now coming to the next question, 10th one, the chronic alcoholic is presenting uh, to the OPD with generalized weakness and lethargy. He was telling stories which was not true as per attendant. It's kind of some uh, stories which are cooked up and weakness and lethargy is there, alcoholic patient attending in turn observed nystagmus, global confusion and ataxia. So it's a classical presentation of B1 deficiency where we call it as one mix. Korsakov psychosis. Confabulation, where the patient is just talking something which is not actually true. So telling the stories which are not true is nothing but a confabulation, weakness, lethargy, nystagmus. Please understand this three finding, global confusion, ophthalmoplegia, ataxia, Ophthalmoplegia means nystagmus, global confusion, ataxia, goa is a very important triad of manifestation which is seen in Bernick's cause of psychosis. So that's a classical feature of B1 deficiency and B1 injection can be advised for this patient. Now coming to next question, iron absorption from intestine is facilitated in ferrous form. Ferrous form. Which of the following favors this mechanism enhances the iron absorption? If you go into the iron absorption DT, this is intestinal lumen and this is the enterocyte and this is the blood vessel. Please understand the iron is being transported by divalent metal transporter 1 into the enterocyte. And what we consume is mainly in the ferric form. So we have very reductase enzyme at the duodenal surface, the mucosal lining, which converts the ferric to ferrous. And in this, the vitamin C play important role as a cofactor. So ferrous, that is why we say add lemon, uh, you know, in your meal, it will enhance the iron absorption because vitamin C is rich in lemon and uh, that facilitates conversion of ferric to ferrous by acting as a cofactor of ferric detectives. So DMT1 brings the ferrous inside, which is like then stored in the form of ferritin. And again, when it is being transported by ferroportin at basolateral membrane, it is transported in the ferrous form, but immediately in the plasma, it is converted to ferric form and then transported by transferrin. So the question is very simple. The vitamin C enhances the absorption of iron by converting it to ferric, converting it from ferric to ferrous form. Now, four-month-old child is presenting with refusal to accept breast milk. Further, workup is revealing hypoglycemia, ketosis, hypoglycemia, ketosis, burnt sugar odor. Now, which following, which of the following enzyme deficiencies is seen in this condition? The catchy point in this uh, question is burnt sugar odor, which is seen in maple syrup urine disease or branching ketone urea. Branching ketone urea. Branch and amino acid during catabolism they are converted to ketoacid and their ketoacids are further catabolized 
you know, with the help of one enzyme complex, which is known as branch and alpha ketoacid dehydrogenase enzyme complex. This complex of enzyme are having three enzymes and five coenzymes with PDH complex, and they are responsible for further catabolism of these branch and ketoacid. In maple syrup urine disease, which is suspected in this baby, is having deficiency of this particular enzyme complex resulting in excretion of all the three branching ketoacids in the urine, giving you blood sugar odor. And these are non-specific manifestations that loss of appetite, refusal to take breast milk, and hypoglycemia and ketosis. And this is a clear cut case of this particular methyl syrup urine disease. The answer is C in this. The urine uh, color will be port wine color urine and odor will be like maple syrup odor and uh, the testing uh, can be done you know the plasma level of leucine, valine and isoleucine are seen to be raised because these are branch chain amino acid they are not catabolized normally when isoleucine is not catabolized it is converted to its isomeric form that is a low isoleucine which is more than 5 micromole per liter in the plasma normally it is negligible DNPH test, dinitrophenyl hydrazine test is done where in urine few drops of DNPH is added in alkali media, they're shaped and you tend to have a yellow precipitate, that's a positive test for, uh, you know, maple syrup urine disease. This is overall outline of the branch in amino acid metabolism, catabolism. These are branch in uh, amino acid, they are corresponding keto acid and they are further, further corresponding thiosters. If you focus on first enzyme, it is branch in amino acid transaminase. The second enzyme is dehydrogenase enzyme complex. Now, this is deficient in maple syrup urine disease, resulting in excretion of all three keto acids in the urine. Urine is turning dark color, port wine in uh, porphyria. So, dark color urine also may be a presenta presentation. Oh, oops, sorry, this I must have. We should have told you during porphyria discussion, the slide is misplaced, but it's all right. That question, if you remember, where porphyria was being asked to you, porphyria, and the, they were talking about the black color of the urine. So there you can see this kind of urine will be there in the porphyria. And, but in maple syrup urine disease, you have maple syrup appearance of the urine like this. And uh, so that dark color urine, black color urine, you can see in alkaptonuria, you can see in uh, porphyria, you can see even in maple syrup urine disease. Now coming to the next question, 13. Wilson's disease due to defect in copper transporter. Where? In the liver. Yes, in the liver. Liver, copper is secreted, excreted into the bile canal. Like the excess copper is getting out of the body via its uh, excretion into the bile canal. Like for that, we need to have copper binding. ATP is 7B. If that is mutated, the Wilson's disease results. Right. The gene which is mutated is, of course, the answer is this. So, Wilson's disease, we have excessive deposition of copper in the liver because that is not getting excreted out of the uh, liver and that results in cirrhosis in advanced stage and liver failure and death. And this copper which is excessive in liver is actually like... Uh, Effluxed into the circulation and uh, getting deposited in various tissues like uh, brain, resulting in neuropsychiatric features, heart, resulting in cardiomyopathy, kidney, resulting in renal failure. So, you cannot expect much of the survival for Wilson's disease. They die in less than 20 years of age. You know, so the defect is copper binding ATP 7B. There is a similar transporter called copper binding ATP 7A, which is there at the GIT mucosa and that's responsible for absorption of copper from the GIT lumen. And if this is mutated, this results in minky kinky steely hair syndrome. So these two conditions you must know clearly that we have similar name for the transporter but this transporter is there in the liver, this transporter is there at the GIT mucosa helping in the copper absorption. So in minky kinky still hair syndrome you understand that there is a deficiency of copper in the, our body system, right? And but in 7B you have excessive copper in the uh, various organs. 
In Wilson's disease, the deposition is also there in the desmid membrane of the cornea, which is resulting in golden brown uh, ring kind of structure seen in the slip lamp examination. You can see double arrow here, which is talking about golden brown uh, color ring. This is called case of flesher ring. It's a very classical presentation of Wilson's disease. Otherwise, you have uh, neuropsychiatric features, you have liver failure, you have case of flesher ring. Now coming to the next question, 20 year old male is undergone surgery where uh, wound debridement was performed and wound is not healing properly. What may be the vitamin deficiency related to delete wound healing? The answer is going to be vitamin C. Vitamin C is um, important for wound healing and uh, it helps in making of connective tissues which are important for wound healing. So vitamin C deficiency is going to delay the wound healing. The collagen which is most commonly seen in fibrous capsule of the joint is going to be type 1. Right. Type 2 is there in cartilages. Type 3 is there in blood vessels and connective tissues. And type 4 is there in basement membrane of glomerulus. And type 1 is richly seen in bone and fibrous capsule of the joints. Coming to 16th question, protein not having quaternary structure. So what is quaternary structure? What is primary? What is secondary? What is tertiary structure? Primary structure is where we just talk about sequence of amino acid in the polypeptide chain and terminal and C-terminal. Secondary structure is where we talk about alpha helix and beta pleated structure where the polypeptide is folded on itself and their interaction is resulting in alpha helix or beta pleated structure. Tertiary structure is three-dimensional structure which is native conformation of the protein in its uh, natural inhabitant. Uh, yes, you know and uh, there certain areas will show you alpha helix, certain areas will show you beta pleated sheet structure and quaternary structure is what where we talk about subunit interactions. Let's see for example this is one subunit and this is another subunit. So the subunit interaction is actually responsible for quaternary structure. So you understand that primary, secondary and tertiary structure will be there in all the proteins. But quaternary structure will be there in only in those proteins which are having more than one polypeptide in them, them which are not monomer, which are having at least uh, two polypeptide or more than two polypeptide in them. They are either dimer or trimer or tetramer or pentamer kind of thing. So the quaternary structure is not there in myoglobin because it's a monomer. But hemoglobin, it's a tetramer. Collagen, that also is having number of polypeptides, you know, three polypeptides in the alpha chain itself. Insulin having an A chain, B chain, they are linked. So they all will have quaternary structure except myoglobin because myoglobin is having only one polypeptide which is similar to the beta globin chain in the hemoglobin. So of course the answer in this question will be myoglobin. Coming to next question. Lesch-Nehan syndrome is because of deficiency of which of the following enzyme. Lesch-Nehan syndrome is because of deficiency of HGPRTase enzyme. HGPRTase enzyme is the salvage enzyme for purine nucleotide biosynthesis. What it does? It salvage hyposanthin to form your IMP. So hyposanthin is not going to go for degradation to form your uric acid. So hyposanthin is salvaged to form your IMP with the help of HGPRTase enzyme. That is hyposanthin guanine phosphoriposyl transferase enzyme. In Lesch-Nehan syndrome, there is a complete deficiency of this enzyme. So that results in no salvage and excessive dumping of hyposanthin to form your uric acid. That is why Lesch-Nehan syndrome, the patient will have uric acid, which is a primary finding, uric acid high hyperuricemia and self-mutilation. That is injuring himself, mutilation as a secondary finding that is neuropsychiatric manifestation. So that's a very, very repeated question. Lesch-Nehan syndrome is an important disorder where a complete deficiency of HGPRT enzyme is seen. It's a salvage enzyme. Now coming to the question number 18. Which of the following cycle is involved in transportation of neutral amino acid across the membrane of intestine, kidney and liver? So Mr. cycle. It's not Mr. It's a Mr. cycle which is gamma glutamine cycle and in this we need to have the glutathione playing role for transportation of amino acid. Krebs cycle is a TCA cycle. Cahill cycle is uh, 
nothing but it's a glucose alanine cycle where we talk about uh, starvation protein breakdown in the muscle and its formation of uric uh, glucose in the liver. Cori cycle is glucose lactate cycle where during exercise the lactate is produced in the muscle in excessive amount. That lactate is going to go to liver to form your glucose. So MISTO cycle is the one which is important for transportation of uh, Mm -hmm. neutral amino acids across the membrane. Now coming to question 19, 8 month old child hypoglycemia between the feet that is starving hypoglycemia. Liver is enlarged hepatomegaly 1 cm below the costal margin. Xanthoma was found that may be because of excessive lipid which are circulating in the blood. Lactic acidosis, ketosis. It's a classical presentation of bone gargary disease which is glycogen storage disorder type 1a. What is the most likely enzyme deficiency? So first you identify the case, the hypoglycemia, hepatomegaly, the excessive lipid, lactic acidosis, ketosis. Remember these are five classical features of bone gurgit disease. And the enzyme in deficient in bone gurgit disease is glucose 6-phosphatase enzyme. The enzyme which is responsible for conversion of uh, uh, glucose 6-phosphate to free glucose as a terminal step of glycogenolysis. So this is how it is like uh, taking please. The glucose 6-phosphate, you know, Glucose 6 phosphate is converted to free glucose in the endoplasmic reticulum by this enzyme glucose 6 phosphatase, and this glucose is then entering the capillaries and coming to the blood. You know, so in deficiency of this particular enzyme, we do not have conversion of glucose 6 phosphate to free glucose, so hypoglycemia results. And this excessive glucose 6 phosphate then enters in various pathways, which results in you know, derangement of the whole system. These are, uh, this may be a kind of presentation with hepatomegaly in the child may be seen and uh, these are various glycogen storage disorder which are having their specific names, you are supposed to know them. Now coming to the next question, 20. 45 year old male working in uh, MNC on routine screening was found to have fasting blood sugar more than 126, glycated hemoglobin uh, more than 6.5%. Now which of the following category this person belongs to? It's a clear cut diabetic patient. So patient has diabetes mellitus. He is not pre-diabetic, he is not a non-diabetic, he is not recovering from diabetes. So you must know the AD criteria for identifying the diabetic, pre-diabetic and non-diabetic patients so that uh, they see that uh, hemoglobin HbA1c, this itself is a independent criteria for diagnosing diabetes. So if its level is 6.5% or more than 6.5% at uh, more than one setting, you can always label that patient as a diabetic patient. So that's one important one. And the fasting blood glucose, if it is more than 126 milligram per deciliter or 126 milligram per deciliter, it's a diabetic patient. And uh, postprandial two hours blood glucose is 200 or more than 200. Again, it's a diabetic. At random glucose along with symptoms of diabetes is 200 more than 200. Again, it's a diabetes, right? So less than 110 is normal fasting blood glucose I am talking to you. If the fasting blood glucose is less than 110 milligram per deciliter, it's a normal case. If it is 110 to 125 milligram per deciliter, it's a pre-diabetic or which is called impaired fasting glucose. Impaired fasting glucose. And if the fasting glucose is 126 or more than 126 milligram per cent, it's a pure case of diabetes, right? So this is how the criteria was laid down and you must know that this classical presentation where fasting blood sugar is high as well as uh, glycated hemoglobin is also say more than 6.5 percent, it's a clear case of, cut case of diabetes. Baby is presenting with stretchable skin and flexible fingers which can reach even to the forearm. Which of the following condition this boy is suffering from? Alert illness syndrome, there is a connective tissue issues and that results in laxed skin in the forearm, in the neck skin as you can see and it can be stretched, you know, to a larger extent, more than the normal and the forefinger can be touched to the, uh, I mean the thumb can be touched to the forearm. That's an important classical presentation of Adler-Denver syndrome and this was the case of Adler-Denver syndrome. 
Now, 40 year old male is presenting with history of edematous swelling in the metatarsal bone. Blood investigation is resulting in uh, so showing you the increased uric acid. Now, this piece of gout which is involving the metatarsal joint. So the enzyme which is associated with this condition is xanthin oxidase. Because if you see the catabolism of uh, purinucleotide results in formation of uric acid and xanthin oxidase is an important enzyme which is making you uric acid. So this is called podagra. You can see the swelling tenderness of the joint here. And this is gout. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.